It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. The Premier is determined to rush into a reopening of this province regardless of the expert advice that he's receiving from his own experts. In fact, yesterday, uh, Dr. Jaffe very clearly said that it would be ideal Ideally, the government would wait before reopening, and that is at the same press conference where she identified the fact that the emergency break that apparently the government is uh, relying upon has no criteria. It's not defined as yet. I apologize. It should have been off. Yeah. Order. Order. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. <laughs> Restart the clock. Recognize the member. Apology, Speaker. Uh, but the bottom line is Dr. Yaffe did say that there is no criteria in place for this emergency break that apparently the Premier is relying upon. In fact, Global's Alan Carter, as a result of this, said this, for better or worse, political leadership has overruled health advice. So here we are. The Premier is literally Order. hitting the gas when he doesn't know how to use the emergency break. This is extremely disturbing, Speaker. Why Question. is the Premier overruling the advice of his experts, the advice of doctors, and continuing on this journey to reopen Ontario to the Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I've always uh, followed the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, and we're going to continue doing this while we make a transition into the framework. And, and uh, the Leader of the Opposition knows very well that uh, at any given time, the local Medical Officer of Health can put out a Section 22 and uh, put a stop to any uh, opening. And again, we're doing this very cautiously. We still have the vast majority of the population in, in Toronto and York and Peel uh, determining if it's gonna go for another couple weeks uh, based on the, uh, the advice from their local medical officer uh, of health, and we're gonna listen to that. So I'm not too sure uh, who the leader of the opposition is listening to, but I'm, I'm listening to the doctors, and I always will. The supplementary. Well, Speaker, it is disturbing to see the lengths to which this government's prepared to go in order to justify the rushed reopening in our province. Last week, we saw the Minister of Education use data that was raised by the modelling table uh, to justify the government's reopening plan. And in fact, just yesterday, Dr. Fisman, who is responsible uh, for that data, uh, that modelling, told QP Briefing, and I quote, that his Order. work was twisted and misinterpreted to justify bad policy choices. How can anyone believe that this government's plan is safe when the experts are saying that their data on which the government is apparently relying is being twisted and misinterpreted? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Chief Medical Officer of Health has provided guidance to the government to delay, not cancel, March break. If it is the position of the member opposite that we should be following the signs and the medical experts, how can she undermine confidence in the medical leader of this province who is trying to ensure every day we are able to recover and able to protect the, the public? I think that does a great disservice to our institutions, and honestly, I'm quite shocked that the leader of the opposition would undermine confidence in the leader who has provided guidance to this province to get us through the worst of this pandemic. Our priority, sir, is our speaker, is to ensure that every day we follow that guidance. It's why we've delayed it. And yes, the mauling did suggest that the, the, this new UK variant will uh, become the dominant strain in and around the period of March break, which is why we deferred it, based on that medical expertise. In fact, the chair of the Medical Officers of Health Response. Council provided that guidance. The Public Health Measures Table unanimously recommended that, and this Premier will follow that advice every step of the way. <laughs> 
Well, Speaker, the minister can rest assured it's the premier whose information I don't trust. It's the premier who I have no confidence in whatsoever. Why? We have seen 3,700 seniors, 3,800 seniors, lose their lives in long-term care to COVID-19 under this premier's watch. We've seen 6,700 Ontarians lose their lives to COVID-19 because of this premier's decisions. And what are those decisions? He is not listening to the experts. In November, he claimed that the experts were good with his framework, his new framework that he unveiled, only to find out almost the very next day that, in fact, they hadn't even seen the framework. That, Speaker, is very troubling. Now their experts are saying that the information that they are providing to the government is being twisted and it's being misinterpreted. When will the Premier actually start listening to the hospitals, to the doctors, to his own experts Question. and prevent this province from going into yet another third wave and lockdown? Premier to reply. Through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I've obviously listened to the chief medical officer from day one. Uh, I've never uh, wavered from that. I've listened to all the CEOs, and maybe if you talk to some of the CEOs of the hospitals, uh, leader of the opposition, you might get some input. Rather than sitting there and constantly criticizing from day one, uh, putting confusion with the, the public about uh, paid uh, sick days, rather than sending uh, inaccurate information out to the public and hurting the public, why, why don't you come and, and, and join us to support the people of Ontario for once, rather than just sit there and criticize and criticize? You know, it's, it's like. It's like listening to nails on a chalkboard listening to you. I'm going to remind all members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, this Premier always goes to the worst, worst places when he doesn't like the questions that the Opposition is asking, but we're going to keep asking them on behalf of Ontarian Speaker, on behalf of the people of this province. Here's another one for him. We know very clearly that when people lose their homes, they cannot self-isolate. When they don't have a place to live, they can't actually you know, do what they need to do and follow the public health advice when it comes to staying home, because they no longer have a home. And yet this Premier, after just a couple of weeks of having an eviction ban in place, has lifted the eviction ban so that he's going to push people onto the streets, he's going to push people into couch surfing, when everybody knows that that's the wrong thing to do. And again, his experts have even identified that this is the wrong thing to do. Last August, when that eviction ban was, li was lifted, thousands of people ended up on the streets. Why is the Premier Question. prepared to do that again? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Um, thanks for the question. Um, our government's been clear right from the start. During the pandemic, uh, the Attorney General applied to the court and we had an eviction ban. When the stay-at-home order came forward late last year, our government moved forward with an eviction ban. And as some of those areas move out of the stay-at-home order, some of them, for example, my riding uh, moved out this week, uh, the eviction moratorium will be lifted. Again, it's a situation uh, that we will continue to monitor. The Attorney General and I will continue to have conversations. But make no mistake, Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Opposition, we've stood up uh, for tenants. We've tried to help uh, with our municipal partners. We've provided almost, all, actually over half a billion dollars to our municipal partners to help keep our most vulnerable housed, and we'll continue to support them. Well, Speaker, the Premier's own experts, his own advisors, have said the right thing to do is to maintain an eviction ban during a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> Dr. Brown, the head of the science table, supports the eviction ban ban saying, and I quote, supporting people so that they can do what's right for public health is what is the right thing to do. Unfortunately, once again, the Premier is not listening to the advice of the experts. In fact, a U.S. study that was done following the rising of a, an eviction ban there showed that the COVID-19 uh, virus hit 150,000 more people specifically because they lifted their eviction ban. So why is the Premier not listening to the experts and prepared to force people out on the streets during a worldwide pandemic? Well, well, spe well, Speaker, again, to, to reiterate my previous answer, our government continues to work with our municipal partners to ensure 
that are most vulnerable are housed in this situation. And in fact, to take a page uh, from the Premier's uh, playbook when he talked about things you can do to help us. I recently wrote Order. to our, my federal counterpart, the Honourable Ahmed Hassan, to point out that our share of the national housing strategy compared to the amount of houses in need uh, lacks 6 per cent. While that might not seem like a big number, it works out to $490 million. So you know what, Speaker? You know what I'll do? I'll send that letter to the Leader of the Opposition, and I'll call on her to help support us so that we can have additional monies from the federal government to help our most vulnerable. The final supplementary. Speaker, I would never support a government that throws people out in the cold during a worldwide pandemic. I would never do something like that because it's the wrong thing to do. Speaker, in fact, this government Order. continues to disregard all Order. of the advice that they're getting from all experts on every front. The evictions ban is one example. The lack of paid sick days in this province is another example. The premature lifting of lockdowns and not doing anything to prevent the further spread of COVID-19 in terms of extra health measures is yet another failure of this government. So, why will this government continue why is this government continuing to silence the experts, to ignore the advice they're getting and headed, continuing to head down on this wrong-headed road of opening too soon without proper measures in place? Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, you want to talk about hypocrisy at its best. You're going to have to withdraw. You're going to have to withdraw. Withdraw, sorry. Apologize. You want to hear people talking out of both sides of their mouth, Mr. Speaker. And that? I'm going to ask you to withdraw. Yeah. I withdraw. I... Please conclude your answer. Yeah. Let me cut to the chase. Let me cut to the chase here. <laughs> The Leader of the Opposition is saying, I'm not listening to the experts, but the Leader of the Opposition and the whole party voted against extending the Chief Medical Officer's term. What gives there? So you, you can't have it both ways. You can't vote against the Chief Medical Officer and say, we don't want this Chief Medical Officer anymore, and then accuse us Order. of of actually Order. not listening. You know, Mr. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals are the party of no. They're the party Response. of pessimism. We're the party of the people. We're the party of yes, and we can get it done, and we will get it done. That's the difference. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Member for Waterloo will come to order, and the Premier will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, parents, students, education workers are doing incredible work to stay safe and stop the spread of COVID-19, but they cannot go it alone. Kids are back in person in schools today in areas like Peel. Give me extra time. Schools are government side come to order. In Stop the call. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. I'm going to give the member for Davenport adequate time to place her question. Start the clock. Keep it classy over there. Good more. Um, I'm going to start again because I think it's important to acknowledge the incredibly hard and important work that our education workers, our students, and our staff are doing to keep our schools safe in this province when we are seeing kids having to return to school today in hard-hit areas of this province like Toronto and Peel. Today, the Premier has a chance. He can change his failed approach to safe schools by fast-tracking my motion to cap class sizes, expand asymptomatic testing and improve ventilation. Speaker, instead of more half measures and hoping for the best, will the Premier finally stand up for students, school staff and their families and pass our motion without delay? Thank you. Mr. Vegetation, your point. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, this government has been standing up for students when we safely reopen schools, contrary to the position of the opposition parties who have called on the government to extend the state home order and therefore keep our schools closed, offside from the public order. opinion of working parents who want their children in class for their mental health and for their development. We are proud that our schools are open, that every child is learning in class in this province, supported by 3,400 Nets new teachers and an additional 890 more teachers to reduce class sizes. But it does not just about about that speaker. It's that 95% of our air ventilation systems have been improved. It's the fact that we have 1,400 more custodians Opposition working in our schools order. and an additional 400 to be hired. We have adopted every advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who has fully approved our plan, fully funded by this government, because we are committed to keeping our schools open and keeping them safe. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the minister's so-called plan won't see broad testing until at least five weeks after most boards have reopened. And once again, they're downloading all the responsibility onto school boards because they can't make a decision. Uh. Frankly, it is a mystery why this, this loose plan for testing is only beginning now. The Premier may recall that the Ministry of Education uh, memos that were obtained by the Toronto Star in January showed that staff were prepared to announce in-school surveillance testing last summer. But we didn't see any testing until November. So, Speaker, can the minister explain why, despite recommendations from experts, from ministry staff, he chose to water down and delay a testing plan that could have detected more cases, informed a stronger response, and, yes, saved lives? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, the opposite members have spent the past six months suggesting the schools have been safe. The Leader of the Opposition commenced her questions today suggesting we should listen to the experts. The Chief Medical Officer of Health has suggested schools have been safe. The medical officers of health in the regions we've reopened them have given their green lights to do so because they know it is safe, because we have personally Order. consulted with, with them to ensure that we build confidence. The fact is, within our schools, we had a low rate of, of transmission, according to the CMOH. In fact, the over 90% of, of cases came from community into our schools. Eight out of ten schools didn't even have a case of COVID when we closed them ahead of the holidays at the peak of transmission in 2020. The fact is, leading medical experts have suggested schools have been safe, and that's going to be supported by expansion of asymptomatic testing. We're in public health regions Spons? across the province. They could deploy it where they need it to, keep, to make sure we identify cases. And we to keep the school safe and ultimately keep them open in Ontario. I'm going to ask the member for Davenport once again to come to order. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Premier, in late December, my riding received some truly devastating news. The governor of Michigan, through its governor, Whitmer, announced that they would be revoking and terminating the Enbridge Line 5 easement agreement in the Straits of Mackinac. Line 5 has been safely in operation for over 68 years, transporting western oil, natural gas liquids from Superior, Wisconsin through Michigan to Sarnia as part of Enbridge's pipeline system. Line 5 is a key energy conduit artery. Its continued operation is necessary to meet the energy demands in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Ontario, and Quebec. In Sarnia Lampton alone, over 5,000 people are directly employed by the petrochemical and fuel industry. A further 23,500 jobs in my community are directly related to providing services and supporting the refining and chemistry industry. Speaker, can the sure. Premier please share what the cancellation of Line 5 would mean to the rest of the province? Thank you. And the Premier to reply. I thank the, the member from Sarnia. You know, Mr. Speaker, I put a call into Governor Whitmer waiting to hear back. We put letters in there. I don't think the governor understands the destruction she is creating, along with her attorney general down there. I know the member has been working around the clock as well with his counterparts in the U.S., and we're communicating back and forth to congressmen, senators, anyone who wants to listen down there. The decision, again, by the governor of Michigan to terminate the easement agreement is totally unacceptable. The decision will directly impact 5,000 jobs in Sarnia and surrounding areas, and to, to mention all the indirect jobs throughout the province. 
thousands, and not to mention with our great neighbours to the south of the border, that's going to create absolute chaos down there and tens of thousands of jobs. I'll give you an example. Pearson Airport, largest airport in, in Toronto. Response? It's in my riding, surrounded by other ridings as well. It's going to be shut down. How are we going to get from point A to point B? How are we going to get goods from point A to point B when they want to cut off this line? It's unacceptable. Thank you. The supplementary question. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you, Premier, for that uh, answer. I'd like to make my supplemental question back to the Premier as well. Premier, Federal National Resources Minister O'Regan said it best. The only way to address this issue, we will need a Team Canada approach. For more than six decades, Enbridge's Line 5 has meant good paying jobs for Ontario and Michigan workers. It's hard to overstate its significance to our shared economy and to good union jobs and non-union jobs. Line 5 safely delivers fuel that powers our job site, that heats our homes, that makes so many thousands of jobs possible, like at the airport uh, for the fuel. Over the last six plus decades, it's meant consistent, reliable work for the union laborers and business who work on with uh, the infrastructure uh, in industry that supports it. As our province recovers from COVID-19, these kind of jobs are more important Question. than ever. Speaker, can the Premier please spare with my constituents and this House about his concern for the cancellation of this project and how we will support the working men and women of my riding? Thank you. Response by the Premier. Again, for fighting for the people of Sarnia and the people of Ontario. We're here to fix the problem collectively, not separately. I implore the, the Prime Minister the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberals, doesn't matter if you're green, purple, pink, whatever party you're from, we need to fight for Ontario jobs. And I'm encouraging again, if the leader of the opposition is, is listening, Mr. Speaker, to join us to fight for jobs. Let me quote from Scott Archer, UA Local 663 Pipefitter Union, which are big supporters, uh, about the effect of ending Line 5. Quote, basically, it would kick the legs out from under Every refinery in town, it would have a devastating effect on employment in Sarnia. And I ask the Leader of the Opposition, are you pro-worker, are you pro-union, then join us, because we're the party for the working class, Respect. not the NDP and not the Liberals. Once again, I'll ask members to make their comments through the chair. Order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Three months ago, I stood in this legislature and demanded that this government take action on COVID evictions and to protect tenants. This legislature passed my motion to ban COVID evictions with unanimous consent. We agreed that this issue is a priority of this House. But months later, this government has once again failed tenants. Thousands of tenants are at risk of losing their homes as this government resumes evictions, while we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Why is the Premier putting corporate landlords ahead of the health and safety of tenants who are being tossed out of their homes? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. Uh, to prevent the, uh, the spread of COVID-19, our government uh, implemented, uh, Speaker, a stay-at-home order. While um, that stay-at-home order was in force, uh, we had our second uh, residential eviction moratorium. As I said earlier in the House, uh, in response to the Leader of the Opposition, that stay-at-home order is uh, being removed in a number of areas, and as uh, they're being removed, the last one will be Toronto, Peel and York uh, on February 22nd, uh, we'll move back in the framework. So, you know, again, Speaker, through you to the member, um, yes, this item was debated in the House, yes, uh, our party supported it, and yes, we implemented it during the stay-at-home order. A supplementary question. Respectfully, Speaker, to the Minister, the pandemic's not over yet. Since this pandemic started, I have heard from tenants across the province. People have lost their jobs. They have lost their income. They have lost their small businesses, all through no fault of their own. Many of these tenants believed this Premier when he said that no one would lose their home during this pandemic. But instead of having any compassion for people in their time of need, this government rammed through thousands of eviction hearings over the last few months. Speaker, I've just received news early this morning that a member of my community in Toronto Centre died in a tent fire in a homeless encampment in my riding in Toronto Centre. Speaker, lives are literally, quite literally, at risk here. 
And my bill to stop COVID evictions will be voted on today. Will the Premier and his government vote for this bill to save lives and help stop the spread of COVID-19 and give folks, folks the help and the hope that they need to get through this? Ask the members to take their seats. And Minister of Municipal Affairs to reply. Thanks. My, my, my thoughts and my prayers go out to uh, the person who lost their life and their family. Um, speaker, since the pandemic, uh, our government has delivered more housing dollars to municipalities to help our most vulnerable than ever before. And, and, and again, I want to reiterate that based on our core housing need, our government is being shorted. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot. It's only 6%. But the difference between 38% and 44% of core housing needs equates to $490 million that I believe the federal government uh, owes Ontario. I believe they owe it to those homeless. I believe they owe it to those people Order. who are struggling to be housed. And Order. We'll continue, you know, no matter whether the member opposite wants to shout me down, we'll continue to stand up for our most vulnerable. We'll continue to tell the federal government Bonds. we need our share, and we'll continue to build housing that helps people in this province. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As early as May of last year, we began to understand that almost 80 per cent of Ontarians who tragically died from COVID or with COVID died in congregate living settings. According to ministry data, almost 60 per cent of all fatalities are seniors in long-term care homes. Now, not only did this government fail to make that meaningful distinction and focus protection where it's required, the government utterly failed to protect our long-term care seniors. Dr. Gary Garber, the former medical director of infection prevention and control at Public Health Ontario, recently testified before the Long-Term Care Commission that bureaucratic concerns prevented a highly trained team of infection prevention and control experts at Public Health Ontario from helping in Ontario's long-term care homes. Professionals specifically trained for this very situation were told to maintain a low profile in order to avoid being subsumed by the newly created Ontario Health. My question to the Premier, when did the government learn that this IPAC team was not deployed? Second, when was this team fully deployed? And finally, question. and I ask that the response be precise, how many out of Ontario's 636 long-term care homes have an approved and implemented infection protocol and control in place today? The response, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. I will, uh, of course, note that the member opposite voted in favour of every single measure that this government has taken uh, in order to uh, bring this pandemic uh, under control, and, and we're certainly grateful for the support that he gave uh, uh, in, in order for us to, 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 make, to take the measures that we've taken to, uh, to combat uh, uh, the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to, to make uh, important investments not only in health care but in long-term care to uh, ensure that our communities uh, remain safe, and I certainly hope that the member opposite will reflect on how important it is to keep the people of the province of Ontario, to take all the steps necessary to keep the people of the province of Ontario safe, as this Premier has done, as the members of this, uh, of this caucus have done, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, for a, a number of months, as all members of this legislature have done. We should be proud of the work that we've accomplished, and I hope the member will reflect on that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and continue Response? to support all of the measures that he has uh, supported uh, throughout the pandemic. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I have not heard a response to how many of Ontario's long-term care homes have an approved and implemented infection protocol and control in place today. My follow-up question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. The tragedy in long-term care, sorry, to the Premier, is the responsibility of this government. Since the first declaration of emergency 11 months ago and having more than four months this summer to prepare for the second wave, the government still cannot fix the crisis in long-term care homes. One of the main reasons for the crisis is a chronic shortage of staff, leading not only to deplorable conditions, but failure to implement a proper infection protocol. Temporary and agency workers are still allowed to work at more than one home, and while this government is continuing to lock down the province, all it takes is one, one worker to bring in COVID into a long-term care home, resulting in a disaster. On January 13th, the Prime Minister offered the Premier military assistance, qualified personnel to help with staffing. In response, the Premier said, quote, I never refuse help, close quote. My question to the Premier, question. why hasn't the Premier accepted help from the Canadian Armed Forces? Why do dozens of homes remain short-staffed when this government can help the situation today by accepting help? And is it because the Premier does not want another military report on the conditions he and his government— Thank you very much. Again, the government house leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I guess I'm somewhat surprised to hear that the, the member opposite, uh, uh, for many months, who voted in favour of all of the measures that we took to uh, protect the people of the province of Ontario, uh, with respect to COVID-19, I'm surprised to hear that now that uh, uh, 
uh, he has uh, he's had a significant change of heart Carter. and that uh, he uh, apparently I guess voted uh, in a way that he didn't want to vote Mr. Speaker uh, uh, I hope that he will reflect on that and will reflect on the important role of members of Parliament to do their duty and their, and, uh, and their jobs effectively. I know that that's what this Premier, this Minister of Health, this Minister of Long-Term Care and all members of, uh, of, uh, of the Governing Caucus have done and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, all of the members of, uh, of this Legislature uh, have done in helping Ontario be one of the leading jurisdictions in North America in terms of its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely there is, Mr. Speaker, but I can tell the member opposite response? that we will not be taking uh, his new advice, which is to uh, 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 to stop all of the protocols that have kept the people of the province of Ontario safe. We won't be doing that. We will continue on the path that we have that has kept people safe and kept our. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recent projections suggest a significant increase in the global hydrogen production market for an estimated 103 billion in 2017 to an expected 207 billion by 2026. The current trends also indicate that on, for Ontario, adopting hydrogen at a high rate could generate $2.5 billion of spending per year, promoting long-term economic recovery and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Under the previous Liberal government, environmental progress stalled. Instead of implementing effective and pragmatic, pragmatic policies, the Liberals ignored expert advice that could have saved Ontarians billions of dollars in green energy spending. Mr. Speaker, putting Ontario on more sustainable paths should not come at the expense of the hardworking people of this province. Can the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks please share with the members of this House how this Question. government plans to utilize innovation to address climate change and reduce emissions in Ontario? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to reply. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Burlington for a, a great, great question. And uh, Our government's vision for a low-carbon hydrogen economy will help advance the progress that we have made over the past two years with our Made in Ontario Environment Plan. We're supporting the growth of this sector. We'll ensure that we are helping to lower Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions over the long term. We're supporting a reliable and affordable energy system in Ontario, and we're, we are reducing regulatory barriers and supporting the member for York the private come sector, to order. Ac academia, and other governments. Mr. Speaker, we have an opportunity to make it easier for private investors to deploy their low-carbon technologies and infrastructure and ramp up the production of this energy source. This means Ontario will have more electric, hydrogen, and other low-carbon vehicles without government subsidies or increased cost to consumers. Mr. Speaker, Response? we recognize the importance of the role of hydrogen can play in the future of this province and view it as an important path forward to addressing climate change and lowering our greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, we're standing with the strategy. We hope the members opposite join on board. The supplementary question. The impacts of this COVID-19 outbreak have been felt across Ontario by families, workers, businesses, and community speaker. During these challenging times, it's never been more important to encourage new industries to contribute to Ontario's economic recovery while addressing climate change through new strategic ways. We know Ontario is well positioned to drive growth in a low carbon hydrogen economy. Our locations within the Great Lakes region is beneficial for trade with the U.S., and we have supported provincial policies and programs in place to to help us grow the hydrogen market. Supporting innovative energy sectors can be done without creating skyrocketing energy pricings, something the previous Liberal government ignored when they enacted their failed Green Energy Act that cost Ontarians billions of their hard-earned dollars. Question. I know this government recently released a hydrogen discussion paper. Can the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks tell us more on how this paper will inform the creation of Ontario's first hydrogen strategy? Thank you. The Minister of the Environment. Thanks again, uh, the member from Burlington, for that question. And, and Mr. Speaker, Ontario is not alone in its interest in hydrogen. Uh, but we do have a competitive advantage to drive growth in a low-carbon hydrogen economy unlike any other region. Our natural gas infrastructure and low-carbon electricity has allowed the province to avoid up to 30 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. Our discussion paper sets out our vision for our new hydrogen economy that will build on our existing strengths. 
where we can create more local jobs and attract investment while helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions using low carbon hydrogen, especially in the transportation sector. Mr. Speaker, there is great potential for the low hydrogen carbon economy. By using this domestic hydrogen, we would import less natural gas from countries such as the United States. This would keep energy dollars in our province, leading to spin-off benefits such Response? as the creation of more jobs. And Mr. Speaker, more importantly, this will improve Ontario's trade balance by $3.2 billion per year. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the COVID crisis has hit our province hard, we know that some of the families are fa feeling the pain more than the others. Blacks, uh, Indigenous, racialized Ontarians, low-income families, and women. Mr. Speaker, these Ontarians are the ones who have been left to suffer, while this Premier chose to stand by and watch. So my question, uh, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, why, when you know your decisions have hurt some Ontarians more than the others, would you vote against my motion to adopt a COVID equity strategy? Government House Leader to respond. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Speaker. Uh, principally, as the member knows, uh, quite honestly, and we've seen this over the last uh, uh, day, uh, uh, these are issues that are brought forward at uh, the table, at the House Leader's table. Uh, Typically, we don't like to be caught off by surprise by motions that are brought uh, that are brought to the table, and uh, as Order. we have done entirely the entire time since I've been House Leader and before me, uh, motions that are brought to the table by surprise are going to be voted uh, down, Mr. Speaker. That's just the way the process works. I encourage the honourable member, if he wants to bring forward a motion for debate that this whole House can consider, uh, he should use his time that is available to him. The member will know he had a lot of time uh, to pass a private member's bill. I was happy to work with him to pass his private member's bill by following the process, Mr. Speaker. So I would encourage the member, uh, when you have, when the member has a, a spot available to him, do it in the proper Response. fashion so that all members of the provincial parliament can have a, a, have a say in that. If it's something that is appropriate for us to pass, we'll pass it. If it's not, we'll vote it down. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, you, you've got the letter last week. Um, um, we know what happens when we don't have an equity strategy, Mr. Speaker. Some Order. people suffer more than the others. We are seeing in it in my community of York Southwestern. Many families in my community are now on the frontline workers of this crisis, Mr. Speaker, because this government chose not to support them or help them stay safe at home. Mr. Speaker, again through you to the Premier, will you commit to ensuring that your government's pandemic response from foreseen rollout to financial recovery has a plan to help those who have been hurt the most? The government house leader again. Uh, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I, I... Uh, just to talk a little bit about the process, uh, this, uh, the House Leader teams have met uh, on three separate occasions and at no time was any of, uh, of the motions that the member talked about uh, or the Leader of the Opposition or the unanimous consensus that we have uh, seen, was that ever brought to the table uh, for uh, priority consideration by the member, uh, by the NDP, Mr. Speaker. The letter in question that they talk about was actually sent to my constituency office. I didn't receive it uh, uh, until uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker. But as I said to the Honourable Gen uh, as I say to the to the Honourable Order. Gentleman through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, this House considers private members' motions and private members' bills. There's a process in place to do that, and the appropriate way to do that is the same way as his bill, his private members' bill, which passed earlier, which was a good bill, Mr. Speaker, was proud to support it. I know all members were proud to support it. If you have a quality piece of legislation, if you have a quality motion, Response. this House will give it its due consideration and will pass it. But, Mr. Speaker, surprises will always be voted down by this side of the House because we have to give it consideration in the, in the appropriate fashion. The member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to address a question to the Minister of Education and talk about mental health support for our children. Since the, pen the beginning of the pandemic, we have been seeing an increasing number of children with mental health problems at the elementary level and at the high school level.
the constant changing of rules and the need to adapt to multiple teaching experiences that actually vary in their effectiveness are making it more difficult for students to stay motivated and to get support when they need it. Now, the government has invested $42.5 million as part of its fall preparedness plan to support students with special needs and provide students with mental health support, and that's great. But my question to the minister is, can the government explain how it is is actually monitoring the implementation of this investment and how it monitors it the effectiveness of the support. The Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, I think we all share a deep concern about the mental health impacts of the pandemic on all students in the province and country. Uh, it is why we have in enhanced funding uh, both in June and likewise in the summer, again in the fall, um, uh, rather in the early winter of 2021, an additional $10 million. We worked with uh, School Mental Health Ontario to create a action kit for all classes to be provided within our schools with respect to building up mental health uh, resiliency, discussing these topics, and encouraging and encouraging our teachers working with our school board mental health leads, uh, as well as the additional 200 mental health workers within our schools to implement that plan, to measure that plan. The uh, area of focus within our discussions with sick kids, likewise the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and a variety of other medical entities is to understand, to measure, and to ultimately uh, take action to remediate impacts with mental health. We're working in conjunction Response. with the Minister of Health, the Minister the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction to continue improving investments in schools and likewise in their cases within our communities to provide a continuum of care for these kids. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The March break has been postponed and the impact is being felt by everyone in education, frankly. Teachers and education workers have been trying to keep up with changing rules while also trying to support the students as best they can. Teachers have privileged relationship with students and they are well placed to identify the children that are struggling with mental health issues and to direct them uh, to appropriate resources. However, they cannot do this alone. Our teachers also need resources. They need training and support so that they are better equipped to effectively support these students. So what resources and training is the Ministry of Education providing to our school boards, our teachers, and other education workers to support them as they work to manage the increase in children struggling with mental health challenges? Minister of Education. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Indeed, many educators and our education staff are on the front lines. Um, and uh, really play a critical role in supporting our children. Uh, the work we provided, the million-dollar additional investment to School Mental Health Ontario was designed to provide uh, useful information to our educators and our frontline education staff to implement within our schools. Uh, the additional 200 mental health workers funded by the province, leveraging all dollars to hire more staff, are making a difference on the front lines to reduce wait times. Additional psychologists and psychotherapists and social workers are supporting that end. Um, we obviously acknowledge that there are impacts, mental health impacts, which is why in the Ministry of Education and in Health, working together to make sure that children, be it in schools or in their communities, could access the care that they deserve. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Attorney General. Ontarians have been calling out for modernization in the justice sector for years, if not decades. Successful or successive Liberal governments let Ontario's justice sector stand still and fall behind. Only since the election of our government have we seen leadership in fostering innovation and change in the province's justice system. The Attorney General has risen on a number of occasions in this House to speak to the changes that our government has made to bring the justice system into the modern era. There is finally strong momentum in Ontario's legal sectors, but we need to know that this change is going to continue. Speaker. The government introduced new legislation yesterday which aims to speed up access to justice here in the province. Can the Attorney General please explain how this bill will benefit the countless Ontarians who access our justice system every day? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my friend and colleague from Kitchener-Conestoga for the opportunity to speak to the work our government is doing to accelerate access to justice in Ontario. 
I work closely with our justice sector partners and to urgently establish new and innovative ways of supporting Ontarians and their need to access justice. In response to COVID-19, we took decisive action and we, we knew that we had to maintain the administration of justice and we achieved a number of breakthroughs. In fact, we, we changed the system decades in a matter of months, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we have changed the culture. We ha now have a, a change of culture. We've created muscle memory on how to collaborate, how to identify barriers, how to break down barriers, and we're not going back to the old ways of doing business, Mr. Speaker. We're building on the breakthroughs, and we've introduced reforms through legislation to address delays. We result, we're going to let people resolve their disputes in front of the judge faster, beyond the courtroom. We're going to help them in rural, northern, and indigenous communities and francophone Response. communities. Mr. Speaker, I'll speak more to the changes we're doing to Ontario's courts, tribunals, the state's law, family law, child protection. I look forward to supplemental. The supplementary question. Well, uh, thank you to the Attorney General for that answer, and I know my constituents will be pleased to hear that the government's continued work to create a justice system that has uh, fewer obstacles for them. These are welcome changes, but Ontarians also need to know that the government is acting to address elements of the justice system that slow down the resolution of their legal matters. This is essential, especially now, as we deal with the impacts of COVID-19. So to the Minister through you, Speaker, what is the government doing to help people resolve their legal matters in fewer days? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, for the chance to talk about the Accelerating Access to Justice Act that was introduced just yesterday. No matter where you live in our province, the growth and well-being of our communities are top of mind. They demand easier and faster access to justice. Our government is committed to continuing our work for Ontarians across the province. And as part of our work, we're committed to strengthening the capacity of the system. That's why, in the proposed legislation, we'll fill judicial appointments faster and reduce delays that let people have their day in court, Mr. Speaker. And the, we've also come forward with a single tribunal for land tribunals for to allow people with applications to move faster to get answers faster to allow things to to move forward more efficiently mr speaker we're also making permanent the virtual signing of wills and powers of attorney something that we brought in during covid has been well received and is something we're going to make permanent saving people time and money mr speaker and we're determined to continue demonstrating through groundbreaking innovation and collaboration that justice accelerated is justice delivered. Okay, the next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When students in the Thames Valley District School Board returned to class this month, they were told to stop washing their hands in their classroom sink. That's because the board found that extensive hand washing created mold in two classroom sinks from too much water damage. In total, the TVDSB discovered that 400 sinks suffered from water damage and a total of 13 sinks had to be removed from classrooms entirely. For almost a year, our public health experts have told us that hand washing is essential to stop the spread of COVID-19. This government categorically refuses to address the billions of school repair backlog. Why isn't this government making vital investments into our classrooms so that London students can stay safe by following this essential public health advice? Mr. Of Education. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are uh, obviously encouraging all students to continue to follow public health advice. The guidance by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, as provided in the school guidance document to educators, staff, and families, is to um, obviously wash hands and, and, and sanitize often, which is why we provided PP, as well as an additional enhancement in funding for the cleaning of schools, as well as more custodial cleaning within the schools. Within the Thames Valley District School Board, for example, COVID funding is up $43 million net new to ensure we can do that. Um, and Speaker, obviously, we'll continue to follow the medical advice of the local and chief medical officer, Dr. Mackey, within your case, uh, really ensuring that students and parents know they can play a role in combating COVID-19 in the classroom and in their communities. The supplementary question. Speaker, the backlog in repairs in schools has gone on under this government's watch for the last two years, and they've done very little to address it. London families are trying their hardest to keep their kids safe, but they need the government's support to do so. I've heard from parents in my writing, like Rachel, who told me her kids returned to school to find the sinks in both my children's classrooms are missing. She told me it's extremely disappointing and frustrating that the provincial government has been telling us there are tougher health and safety measures put in place for the return to school, when in fact nothing is different, and actually things are worse since there are now no sinks. 
Speaker, parents in my riding want to know, when will this government stop sitting on their hands and start helping our schools move forward, not backwards, in the fight against COVID-19? Mr. Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is this government that is investing $1.3 billion in maintenance funding to reduce the backlog we inherited from the former Liberal government. Billions of dollars, $15.5 billion. That is a matter of fact uh, that is very concerning that the state of our schools were undermined by the former government, the former Liberal government. But the truth is, under this Premier, we've allocated an investment, a capital investment, uh -huh. every single year of $550 million. In London alone, I was proud to join my colleague, uh, the Minister, uh, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, to announce multiple net new schools in the south and northeast of London, if, as I recall correctly, Order. new schools for the people of London who deserve it after years of neglect by the former Liberal government. We're going to continue to invest in maintenance, continue to invest historic investments in capital funding, and I assure you those dollars will reach the ground to ensure those families Response. have confidence that their schools are safe every day. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, here in the Legislature, if any one of us becomes ill, we have the opportunity to stay home, uh, to limit the, uh, the risk of spread, and to, uh, to look after ourselves. And, uh, Minister, we still get paid uh, to stay uh, home. That means we can continue to pay the bills, support our families, and do what medical experts are suggesting, to stay home. The Premier likes to say often that we're in this together. Well, how can that be when, if any of us become ill, we can actually stay home, but an everyday person can't? Mr. Speaker, I have a simple question to the minister. Does the minister believe it's okay to deny workers the right to pay sick leave, a luxury that he has himself? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the very first uh, piece of legislation that this uh, legislature passed that our government introduced was to protect uh, jobs across the province. Uh, no one can be fired in Ontario because of COVID-19. If you're home in self-isolation, if you're in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad that has to stay home and look after uh, a son or a daughter because the schools uh, were closed, you can't be fired for that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, furthermore, I also eliminated uh, the need for sick notes uh, here in the province of Ontario. But Mr. Speaker, Thanks to the Premier of Ontario, in partnership with all of the other provincial and territorial uh, leaders across Canada, worked with the federal government to ensure that $1.1 billion, two weeks of paid sick days, is available to every worker Response. in the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister, the majority of Ontarians support paid sick days. Their gov your government got rid of the two sick days that were here uh, immediately as you form government. No one in Ontario should have to choose between paying bills or staying home while sick. As Minister of Labour, you have the opportunity to stand up with workers here in Ontario to show them compassion and to simply do what is right in the middle of a global pandemic. Later today, I'll introduce a private member's bill, Mr. Speaker, that will ask this House to support 10 paid sick days. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister. Will you stand behind the hardworking, on, hardworking Ontarians and support 10 paid sick days so workers can better protect themselves, their workplace, and their loved ones? Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, so the member opposite understands. Uh, thanks to the leadership of the Premier of Ontario, working in partnership with the Liberal Prime Minister of Canada, we've delivered two weeks of paid sick days to the people of this province and to all uh, Canadians. Mr. Speaker, there is still $800 million left in the bank account for workers to apply for and to receive uh, sick pay. Furthermore, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to let the member opposite know that uh, as of two weeks ago, more than 110,000 workers in the province of Ontario have either begun receiving uh, paid sick days or have applied for paid sick days. It is a responsibility of you, sir, of every MPP in this legislature, every municipal and federally elected representative in this province, to let workers Response. know that there's two weeks of paid sick days available to them. Question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This week, I am sitting in landlord-tenant board hearings that are deciding the fate of dozens of families in Beaches, East York. 
families that lost income to COVID, moms and dads working their tails off to pay rent and arrears, but who are being evicted by corporate landlords who don't care that they've used all their savings trying to keep a roof over their heads, who don't care that evicting them will push them into homelessness. These corporate landlords have refused to meaningfully negotiate with their tenants as they are required to do by law. Instead, they've tried to force the tenants to sign onerous repayment plans that the tenants can't afford and which amount to signing their own evictions if they're a day late or a dollar short. When is the Premier going to follow through on the promise he made way back last March that no one would be evicted in Ontario because of COVID? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I don't know the details that the member is talking about in terms of her appearing in front of the board. I hope she clears it with the Integrity Commissioner, but that's between her and the Integrity Commissioner. Mr. Speaker, I do want to say that the Independent Landlord and Tenant Board, the Independent Tribunal System, uh, has gone through unprecedented times, unprecedented challenges. Uh, tenants and landlords need to have their, their hearings for, for whatever the issue is, Mr. Speaker. And we've worked very hard with the tribunals to make sure that they're properly resourced. Uh, that they can do the work that they independently need to do, Mr. Speaker. We need to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we have hearing officers in place to hear the important matters that tenants bring forward and that landlords bring forward. It's, it's really important that we have the system working uh, efficiently, uh, that it's functioning. They've transitioned amazingly to, to uh, online and, and alternate ways of having hearings to keep it moving through these unprecedented times, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you. And this isn't about the LTB board specifically. It's about the fact that we need a ban on evictions. Speaker, Zanat Jahan is a single mom. Her husband died of cancer in January last year, and two months later, she lost her job in the first wave of COVID. She got an eviction notice from Pinedale Properties, one of the biggest evictors in Toronto, after she missed just one month's rent. They wouldn't negotiate in any way that could be called meaningful. They tried to bully her at just as co corporate landlords are bullying tens of thousands of tenants across Ontario. Just yesterday, their lawyer argued at the LTB that the fact that we're on a, in a pandemic should have no bearing on whether a tenant like Zanat should be evicted. Last March, the Premier promised no one would be evicted in a pandemic, but tens of thousands of families like Zanat's are on the verge of homelessness through no fault of their own. When is the Premier going to do his job and protect them? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. Um, like the Attorney General, I'm not going to comment on any case that's uh, before the, uh, the tribunal. But I do want to reiterate some of the measures that our government uh, have been able to do. I want to take members back uh, to April of this year when our government uh, made a historic um, program offering with the federal government. We were the first province or territory in Canada that signed on to the Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit. And, Speaker, we've already been able to help over 7,000 uh, of our most vulnerable stay housed through that portable housing benefit. This is in addition to the other, member, other measures that I talked about earlier in question period, the, the $510 million through our social services relief fund. In fact, um, we've allocated uh, over $189 million to the City of Toronto through the SSRF, making the total homelessness allocation for the City of Toronto over $395 million. That's in addition uh, to the response that our government has put forward for 2021. There are many, many measures that our government has provided and continue to provide. Again, to this member, as I've done to the other two, please stand with us. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Health. Uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, the manufacturer of uh, 60 fibrosis modulator drugs, has submitted an application to Health Canada for Trikafta to be accepted for priority review. The Minister's federal counterpart has agreed to fast-track this life-enhancing drug through the Health Canada approval processes. This suggests a review timeline, timeline of 180, 180 days. As the Minister knows, negotiations for other cystic fibrosis modulators have dragged on in many cases for many years, particularly at the level of the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, which negotiates prices. So my question is, what is this government doing to ensure that Trikafta is approved by both Health Canada and the, CP, uh, and the PCPA on a priority basis question. so that Ontarians with cystic fibrosis 
can begin enjoying longer and healthier lives immediately. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. I know this is an issue of great importance to you and many of your constituents. The, uh, the fact is that Trichafta has shown great promise as an effective treatment for Ontarians living with cystic fibrosis, and so it is very welcome news that the manufacturer of Vertex has applied to Health Canada for its approval. But it's also really important to note that at the same time, simultaneously, uh, Vertex has also applied to the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, or CADAS, for a review at the same time. This is not normally done. Normally, they're done sequentially. So having them both uh, being applied for uh, simultaneously should lead to a shorter timeline for review so that hopefully this product can get on the market to assist people with cystic fibrosis in leading happier, healthier lives. Thank you. The supplementary. Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And yes, it is, uh, it is good news that uh, there are simultaneous processes going on at the, at the federal level for Trikafta. Um, however, uh, the other Vertex uh, CF drugs have been sitting in the pipeline, particularly at the Can-Panadian uh, Pricing Alliance, uh, for a long, long time now. All of the provinces and territories are, and federal government are members of that alliance. And so I'd ask the minister to once again do everything she can to, once Trikafta gets to the pricing board, that, that she use her influence there to speed that process up. And secondly, once it gets through the pricing board, uh, will the minister commit to putting this on the Ontario formulary so that it has that, so these modulators have are accessible to cystic fibrosis patients? Because in the past, Question. once it comes out of the pricing board, it can take many months and years to go through the formulary process here in Ontario. So I'm wondering if you can speed that process up, Minister. Minister of Health. Yes, well, thank you very much for that. As I'm sure the member well knows, there is a three-step process for the approval of new drugs in Ontario. It has to be approved by Health Canada, then go through CADETH, then go through the CPCA. And uh, this process is important to make sure that any new drugs coming onto the market in Ontario are uh, effective, safe, and provide value for money. So the, uh, I recognize the concerns that have been expressed with respect to the other two drugs produced by Vertex, Kaleidico, and um, or can be, yes, that uh, hopefully will be uh the uh, Trikafta will join them. That is something that we've been waiting for. This is very important to the ministry as well, because as you have received notes and letters from many of your constituents, we hear from people across Ontario that Ontarians are living with cystic fibrosis are very anxious for these products to be available on the market. And I can assure you that Response? as soon as the final approvals are obtained, we will move quickly to make sure that all three products get onto the formulary. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Brampton is one of the worst hit cities by COVID-19. There have been more than 40 outbreaks in our schools, yet this Conservative government refuses to bring in a 15-student class size cap. There have been almost 100 outbreaks in our workplaces, yet this Conservative government refuses to bring in permanent paid sick days. Almost 400 people have died in long-term care and retirement homes throughout the Peel region. Yet this Conservative government refuses to properly fund our health care system. More than 220 people have died in Brampton from COVID-19. More than 36,000 people have been infected with COVID-19 in Brampton. This Conservative government has failed Brampton, and they must be held accountable. Will the Conservative government act now to properly fund Brampton so we can fight COVID-19? Minister of Health, your point. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This is an important issue, and since the beginning of this pandemic, our government has focused on protecting the health and safety of all Ontarians, regardless of where they live. Now, as it happens in Peel Region, this has been an issue where there have been higher than uh, levels of COVID-19 than in some other parts of Ontario, so that York, Peel, and Toronto have been placed into a later date for entering back into the framework as we do this, it's not a reopening, it's a transition to move those areas that are higher areas into lower areas. Peel is doing great work right now. Uh, hopefully, very soon, they will be able to transition back into the framework. But that is something that we are paying attention to uh, across the entire province, including Brampton, to make sure people are safe and healthy there as well. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.
We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 244, an act to amend the Residential Tenancies Act 2006 with respect to evictions during COVID-19's pandemic. The, bell will ring, the bells will ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.